Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. This video is not an episode of the rapid rating climb as is normally scheduled, but that will continue in tomorrow's video. Quite honestly, today, I kind of don't have enough time to do a full-fledged rapid rating climb video just because I've got so much going on today and I wasn't able to record in advance, unfortunately, because I had exams going on. However, today's video, I'm going to be going over a classical game that I played about a month ago now. Uh, I was I, I was actually called uh, as like a reserve player to play for one of the teams in my club that's like higher because we have a bunch of different teams at the club because it was a must win game and my ratings been going up a lot this season so far so they wanted me to play on board five for them and this was a must win game because essentially the team I was playing for is our B team in division one of the BDCL which is the Birmingham District Chess League and to ensure that they didn't get relegated we needed to win this game there are six boards in total so there's like a it's, it's, it's like a 6v6 format, but regardless, I have the white pieces against a player much lower rated than me, so I needed to win this game. And, spoiler alert, this game was not very long, and it was in the Vienna Gambit, and I will go a bit more in depth in some of the lines, because it isn't very long, and hopefully give you guys a really good idea of some of the attacking possibilities in the Vienna Gambit in this particular line. If you don't play the Vienna Gambit... I mean, sure, from a theoretical point of view, it might not be that useful, but just from like an attacking point of view, like the general ideas and themes are still going to apply to many openings because, hey, surely you want to attack your opponent, right? Take you make like use of weak squares, weak diagonals, all of that jazz. So, with that being said, <laughs> we have Knight C3, the Vienna game, Knight F6. You don't have to play Knight F6, but it's one of the most popular moves. And I go F4, the Vienna Gambit. And really, there are three responses to this... Mm, two responses to this move. Being D6 to defend the pawn. Or D5... Whoops. Or D5 to strike back in the center. And after white takes, you're supposed to take on E4 with the knight. My opponent spent quite a while after this move F4, and he was an older guy, so he might not have seen it before, or seen it for a very long time. Because it is kind of like what I would consider a new age sort of opening. It's become popularized in like the past few years by the Gotham Chess course, which I have, and it doesn't cover absolutely everything in the Vienna Gambit, but that's because there's so much to go over. I'd highly recommend it if you want to learn it regardless. Maybe I can convince you with this video if you don't already play it. So d6 and d5 are the main moves. d6 to defend the pawn and d5 to attack my center. So you might be saying, okay, if d6 defends the pawn, can you not just play knight c6 to defend the pawn? That's what my opponent played. This is a mistake though. The problem is, if you go d6 and then I take and then you take, black is better. Because I have a weakened king side, like this diagonal is quite weak. And the f-file is open, and yeah, I could use that to my advantage, but black's going to play moves like bishop c5 to take control of this diagonal, make it difficult for me to castle and actually utilize the f-file with my rook. You know, both his bishops are already open, it's going to be easy for him to castle, easy to develop his other knight. The position is just better for black. So after d6... You know, knight f3 is the move just to put more pressure on, maybe get the bishop out to c4, play d3. Typical Vienna game ideas. But after knight c6, you can take. And the difference is, <clears throat> after knight takes, you're not taking back with the pawn. So firstly, this bishop isn't getting out anytime soon because you don't have this pawn developed. And there is one move here to really seize the advantage with white and the computer says it's plus 0.49 i would i i would personally say this is more like plus one and the move is d4 and this is very reminiscent of the halloween gambit and i will just show you the halloween gambit real quick because it comes after the four knights game and you sacrifice a knight on e5 to play d4 kick the knight out play Wait, D oh, D5, yeah. 
knight e5, f4, knight g6, e5, kick this knight all the way back to g8, and you get a massive center. You can play moves like d6. Um, I mean, I don't know this opening that well, but the whole point is that you take a ridiculous amount of space and you kick your opponent's knights around while you do it. Yes, you have to sacrifice a knight for it, but the position, you know, it's only minus 0.5. Like, considering you're down a knight for a pawn, that is insane compensation. See, the problem with what my opponent did in this game is we basically got that exact same thing, except I didn't sacrifice a knight for it. You get what I mean? Like, I forced a knight to the e5 square with my pawn rather than sacrificing my knight. This is not good. <laughs> it's not good. And yeah, I don't have um, the f4 pawn to move up to play something like d5, knight e5, and f4. But I don't have to do that. I can instead play the move e5, which in this line is more critical, because again, I can't go d5, knight e5, f4, because I don't have an f pawn. So e5 is the move. And the problem is the knight can't move forward because I control these squares, and they can't move forward here because I control these squares. Now, I actually saw this in the game, and I've never seen it before. You can actually play knight d5 in this position, because after knight takes d5, you have queen 2 h4 check. And if you play g3, then queen e4, and you can go king f2. You can't take the rook. I don't think you can take the rook because of knight takes c7, but you can take the knight back. Knight f3. White is up no material here, but he has a massive center. You're probably going to play like c4, maybe d5, take a massive control. And yeah, your king is kind of exposed, but it's difficult to actually take advantage of that. However, knight d5 is a difficult move to, move to find, and my opponent doesn't play it. He plays the more logical knight to g8, and he was taking a fair bit of time here. Like, we start the game with an hour 20. And as of move six, he was down to like an hour and five minutes. So like, you know, I was blitzing these moves out because I know these moves. So that must have been quite off-putting for him because like over the board chess is very psychological. It really is. So I went knight f3. Knight f3 is an important move because you, while you might want to play a move like bishop c4 to target the f7 pawn, again, queen h4 is a problem. You can't really go g3. Because not only does a d4 pawn hang, but, I mean, oh, you can't go queen e4, what am I on about? The knight controls that square. That was the whole point of going knight d5 in the other line to force the knight off of the defense of there. But you can just win the d-pawn, right? So you start with knight to f3 to control the h4 square. You can play bishop f4 and then retreat the bishop or go g3 if the queen comes out to h4. But knight f3 is more accurate. And, I mean, just look at the position. Like, look at it from the black side. This is this is rough. And the best move here is d5. d5 is a tough move, though, to actually play. Because if white takes en passant, then black is fine. Because white's big center is gone. Yeah, you've got a d-pawn, but it's only one pawn. Your king's kind of open. And black has very good development. But the problem is that white isn't going to take. You're just going to keep developing. This is a really annoying pawn because it's stopping your pieces from going to the squares that they want to go to, that they would have gone to in the other line if I'd have taken en passant. And yeah, black can develop with moves like bishop to, I don't know, b4, knight to e7 in castle, bishop e6. But white has so much, so much pressure on the king's side like, you're going to castle, get the rook on the f-file, advance the knight, the bishops are pointing towards there, the queen can get out at some point. If you move this knight and play c3, you can completely lock the center. This knight is out of the game because it's controlled so well by the pawn wedge in the center. So d5 is tough to play, even though the computer believes that it's the best move in this position. My opponent instead goes d6. And d6 is a good move, because again, if I take, we get the same position, as if I'd have, as if he'd have played d5 and I'd have taken en passant. But the problem is I don't need to take, again. Yeah, he's attacking me, but so what? I go bishop c4. 
I don't know why the computer considers that an inaccuracy. It's kind of torn between bishop b5 and bishop c4. Bishop b5 is a good move, because I mean, you can't take so d5, I assume. I know a6, bishop a4, b5, bishop b3, knight a5. This is good for black. So what's the move here? Oh, knight e5. And if you go a6, take, take, castle, you got pressure here, pressure here, queen might be coming out. Okay. I went bishop c4 though, and I consider this to be a far more difficult move to handle. And the computer literally gives it a higher like evaluation than bishop b5, so I don't really understand that. And I'm letting my opponent take on e5 if he wants to. My opponent didn't take on e5, but I'm giving him the option, and it's the best move technically. And I know this, like I know this position like somewhat in my head. I was like, I know if I get the big center and my opponent goes d6, I don't worry about it. I just keep developing. Because my plan was, if d takes e5, I'm going to castle. You can't continue taking because knight g5. If you continue taking pieces, you're getting mated. Like, I don't get me wrong, I didn't calculate this entire line because I don't need to calculate this entire line. It is so obvious that this is... I was just looking at the computer moves. I'm not a genius. <laughs> I, But, you know, if you get to this position, you're a piece down, but you should be more than confident that you can checkmate your opponent here. Like, the king literally has no moves. You cut him off from all angles, and everything in your attack is defended. Your opponent isn't developed whatsoever. He's got one knight out on c6. This is game over. There are so many different wins here. So, okay, say your opponent doesn't take on c3. Say he goes knight to h6 here. Yeah, you've got three attackers. That's the beauty of having the open f file. You can just take. If you take back, bishop f7. And again, apparently, black is just getting mated. Again, did I calculate this? No, because there's no need to calculate this whole thing. It's clear that black has no moves. Like, he can't do anything. His king is just stranded in the center with no hopes of castling. F7 is so weak. Your rook is open, your queen's open, your bishop's open, your knight's open. Black is not developed. He spent so long trying to attack your center. And remember, earlier, d4, e5, you literally kicked his knight out of the center while grabbing a ton of space, developing your pieces. Black tries to play with the pawns. You continue developing. If he takes you, you continue developing. If he takes you, you attack. Like... At the end of the day, that's a brilliant move apparently. I don't know whether I give it a brilliant. At the end of the day, there's way too much pressure. The goal of chess isn't to win material, it's to checkmate your opponent, right? So, my opponent didn't take on e5. Now, don't get me wrong, after castle, he doesn't have to continue taking. He can play a move like knight to f6 to try and block the f-file off. This is still very bad, though. Apparently, I can just take here even trade the queens, take with the knight, and this knight has to move, and then I'm winning f7, and I'm just up a pawn. I can even play a move like e6 here to try and suffocate the black position, or I can just play simply with like knight c3. Check, like, this is, this is not good. Like, look at my pieces, and then look at his pieces. This is a very, very bad position. For my opponent to try and play. So, again, I did not calculate all of this. I got to this position in my head. So this was the position on the board. I got to this position in my head and I was like, this is game over if he tries to take me. So he didn't take me. He didn't. Like I said, I'm going quite in depth with these lines because it's not that long of a game. And I don't have quite enough time to record a full rapid rating climb episode because of the reasons that I previously mentioned. I hope this is helping you guys, though, not only if you want to play the Vienna Gambit, but also if you just want to improve your attacking chess in general.
you got to learn when is the time to sacrifice material. And here I think it's a no-brainer. So bishop c4. My opponent goes h6. Now h6 looks quite logical. Because of many of the reasons that I was mentioning before. Like a lot of the time my knight is coming to g5 and putting massive pressure on f7. So h6 looks logical to take away that square. Black does not have the time to be doing that. He really doesn't. And again, there are moves like bishop g4, you, you, you might think, to try and pin the knight to the queen, but then I just castle. And I have some big threats here. Like, if my opponent plays a move like bishop e7, trying to get castled quickly, you can see the evaluation bar jumping. I had calculated this in the Vienna game, uh, the, and the, the Vienna game and the Vienna gambit, whether they accept the gambit or not. In so many positions, this bishop on g4 is way too vulnerable because of the open f file. There's so many ideas of bishop takes f7, king takes f7, knight to g5, double check. You can't take the knight. King goes back, bishop hangs. And I win a pawn. Your king can no longer castle. I just got rid of one of your best pieces. And this is going to be a crushing attack in all reality. So my opponent, I think, realized that bishop to g4 was not a good idea for these tactical reasons. So he went h6. Again, this is hanging. I don't... No, not hanging, but like it can be taken. Again, I don't want to take on d6. This is basically equal now. Because again, black gets the development he wants. He can castle. Yeah, maybe I'm still a bit better, but black's okay. No, in this position I castle. I go, bro, take me. You can't take. Because bishop f7. I saw this in the game. King takes, knight e5. Double check. King moves, knight g6. I win the rook. Or actually, um, taking the bishop is probably better. Like this. Right? h6, yeah, it stops my knight from coming to g5. But it also gives me the control of the light squares. Because if the king goes to a square like e8, then queen h5. And you can't play g6 because you just took your defender off of there. And I just got rid of your other defender of that square. You're getting mated. Because this knight is so strong, this rook is so strong, and my queen gets into the action. For the cost of a piece, yeah. You know, I sacrifice my bishop on f7, but what are your pieces doing? They're all stuck. They're all they're all back home. They're not doing anything. My pieces are incredible. This is attacking chess. You know? It's not about material all the time. Yeah, an attack can finish in winning material. But it's about, like, the way that your pieces move. Like, how much power an individual piece has. Not how much, val like, material value a piece is, if you know what I mean. Like, okay, this knight is worth three points. This bishop is worth three points. This knight is far better than this bishop, you know? So, again, I castle, and he can't take because I'm going to sack my bishop. My opponent saw this. Fair play to him. The best computer move, by the way, is d5, and it has been for a few moves. Just trying to block off the diagonal, but I can just take. And I think... Honestly, I don't know what the point is. What's bishop g4 here, but here surely I can just take on f7. Give a discovered check. Like this. And <laughs> he wants to play knight f6. Like, this is just such... It's just game over. Like, there is way too much pressure, and my pawn wedge in the center is doing an incredible job. You can trade queens, but I'm just winning a piece. Again, like I said, not, not every attack has to end in checkmate. If I can go up a knight, I'm going to go up a knight. Like, no, no questions asked. So, like I say, I castle. And it's tough. It's so tough for black to try and defend this position. You can't even play a move like bishop to e6 because of d5 on the 4 queue. And you can't do this because I'm just going to take. Or I'm going to take here, and if you take back, then I can just take on f7. Double check. I can win this knight. Again, you can't take because it's double check. In a double check, the king has to move. 
because you can't block two pieces attacking your king at once for obvious reasons and you can't take two pieces at once for obvious reasons so you have to move your king yeah i can win this knight but you're actually just getting mated like it's not even funny it's game over so after castle black is dead like he really is dead after nine moves black's played a lot of like natural looking moves and he's completely losing he goes f6 now f6 isn't a bad try and he spent i think like 10 minutes on this move it's not a bad try because his point is that bishop takes f7 sacrifices no longer work because previously like i was saying if you just play a nothing move i can take on f7 and give this double check which makes my knight move with tempo i can bring my queen out to h5 to take advantage of the weakened light squares because my knight is able to move with tempo on the king because my rook opens up with check as well right and then it's game over f6 however f6 means that bishop f7 doesn't work because after king takes you can't move your knight with a check because this pawn is in the way which stops the rook from attacking the king so it's kind of an interesting move right and if you can't move this knight with tempo then it's difficult to bring your queen out to the h5 square to take advantage of the weakened light squares but here I find the best move and I would encourage you to try and find it. I think it's quite an instructive idea. So pause the video real quick, try and find the move. I think it will really help with your attacking chess if you can find this. Okay, so I hope you did actually pause the video and try and find this for yourselves. The move is knight h4. And knight h4 is a beautiful move in my opinion because it's not what it's not the first move that comes to your mind. You might be looking at moves like d5 or, I don't know, knight d5 or knight g5, trying to do something really fancy. These moves don't work because your queen isn't coming to h5 because the rook covers that square. Apparently white is still better, which is actually crazy, even though he just gave up an entire knight. Like, the position is so bad. You could take on f6, but then knight takes f6. The knight now controls the h5 square. The f file is blocked off. Again, it's still better for white. But you're just letting black develop for no reason. This knight isn't going anywhere. I went knight h4. And it's interesting, because I was calculating lines like knight g to e7, queen h5 check, king d7, and e6 mate. Like these were the lines I was calculating, and it's like, this is so over. Like, what can he even do? Um, well, there were some other lines as well. Uh, the move I was expecting was actually queen to d7. Trying to give the king the d8 square to breathe. Because it, look, the position is horrible, right? We all know that. So this uh, queen to d7. e7 doesn't really work because of the simple knight g6 and you just win a rook. So I was expecting queen d7 because if queen to h5 check, then king d8. I mean, don't get me wrong. White is still winning here. But black has some chances to try and hold on with moves like queen e8 pinning the knight to the queen and it becomes a little bit difficult to actually break through in this position it's funny the king and the queen have literally swapped like swap squares to try and get so the king can get off of the light squares because that's where black is dying because he's put all of his pawns on uh dark squares right but the problem is if you play queen to d7 i don't have to give you a check i was planning on playing e6 in this position and there's a big problem because if you move the queen back to d8 again you're getting mated 
you don't have the d7 square to go to. Because if you can go to d7 and block my queen coming in with a, any kind of piece on e7, you might survive. But I always have this e6 move. Black doesn't have enough time to take my pawn. And as we already established, he couldn't take the pawn here because of bishop f7, king f7, knight e5. And he couldn't take the pawn in this position. If you take here, then queen h5. Again, if you try and go for king d7 and queen f7 and queen e7, yeah, maybe you survive here, but I'm not going to do that. Queen h5, king d7. I can play moves like rook d1. I can play moves like knight f5. I can play moves like knight g6. I can play moves like d5 maybe. I can maybe even just take and open up the d file. Maybe this is more resilient for black, but it's still bad. But everything's bad. So I think I kind of expected him to go for something like this. And I thought, yeah, I must be better. Like, I must be. Even if I don't see the immediate win. Here, the best move. I saw this. My opponent played this. Is h5. h5? Now, the point of h5 is just to stop queen h5. Because the rook now defends this square, right? Because the pawn has moved up. And it allows the rook to have control of the h5 square. It's quite an interesting move. And it's kind of difficult to actually break through this. Now, there are many moves in this position. You can take on f6. But again, knight takes f6. And I thought, aren't I just helping black here? Am I not just helping him develop? Why would I do that? Even if the computer thinks it's the best move. So, I'm like, okay. Bishop g4 might be coming, but that's kind of annoying because he's actually getting a bit of development and a bit of counterplay. If I play a lazy move like a3, like bishop g4, and I'm still better, but nowhere near as good as I was previously, you know? I have to work a lot harder. So I thought, okay, let's just play simple. Knight g6. Not the perfect move. But I thought it was the most practical move. Again, I was expecting the move bishop g4 in this position. I was going to play queen to d3 to support the knight. And if the knight moves, I can maybe put my queen on d3 myself. And the problem is you can't save your position. If you move the rook to try and save the rook, then firstly, I can just take on g8 because the rook relinquishes defense of the knight. Apparently I can also take on f8, and if king takes, oh yeah, I just win the rook, right? The problem is you can't really defend this rook. If you put the rook on um, h6, then again, I can just take. And if you take back, I can take the rook or I can take the knight, like, and like take the knight and then take the rook. So I was just going to liquidate this position, like so. Give a check, and... You're getting mated anyway, because I just removed all your defenders. So it's a tough position. Like I said, bishop g4 is what I was expecting. It's a, you know, your rook is hanging, but you use danger levels to attack my queen. So I have to respond to that move first. And the, I mean, the game goes on. Like I said, this isn't the perfect line from the computer. But I thought it was the easiest way to secure a victory. Because like I said, this was a must-win game. And this is apparently the best line for black to take here. I was just going to take the rook and go, look, I'm up a rook. I'm threatening your knight. Black is supposed to trade queens here. But then I just, I'm up a rook and a knight for a couple pawns. Like, obviously, I take this position every single day of the week. And maybe black castles... And his argument is that my pieces are a bit stupid. But I'm up of rook and a knight. Like, I don't care if my pieces look a bit stupid. You're not mating me. There's no queens on the board. So the move I was expecting was rook h6. And the point I believed was here, if I take on g8, then you can take on g6. And then I was going to take on h5 and then win the rook. But you can play knight e7. I thought this was a bit more resilient from black to defend the rook like this. Because you can't play king f7 because my bishop controls that square. 
I can even play the move bishop h7 here, which in all honesty I didn't see in the game. I saw up to this position, and I was like, yeah, I'm up a pawn. He can't move his rook. He can't develop his bishop. His queen is kind of stuck. This is game over. I can even play a move like, I don't know, knight d5, trying to remove the defender of the rook. And you can't really do anything about it. Computer wants moves like rook g2. Um, well, moving here, here, and like sacking the rook like this. But I mean, it's still game over. I can even do stuff like this to force the king out. And <laughs> this is kind of hilarious. <laughs> Just to chase the king around. But this was my plan. Even if it wasn't the perfect plan, it was the most simple plan, in my opinion. My opponent played rook h7. I took on g8. Like, yeah, your rook's under attack, but the rook was defending the knight, so I just take the knight. And here my opponent resigned. Because I'm attacking your rook, and you can't move the rook, and I'm also up a knight already. Your best move is probably rook h6. And I can just take it. And now, what, I'm up an entire rook, and you're probably getting mated anyway? That's the power of the Vienna Gambit. I hope this was useful to you guys. If you stuck around to the end of the video, thank you very much. Uh, again, apologize that there was no rapid rating climb episode today, but there'll be one tomorrow. Don't you worry. I'll see you in the next one.